correct? Yes. Uh, would you be willing to discuss potential changes? You know, there's a difference to me between a hospital and you, if you have three docs that need to bring them forth in a private practice. It's a little bit of a different business scenario, a different relationship between the employer and the employee. Many of the hospitals are not for profit. Uh, you know, I think I, I would be more comfortable balancing that line where you've got a distinction between a purely business relationship and one that where the employer has a an obligation, if you will, a, it's their mission to service the community. I know all physicians kind of are supposed to be that we have our, our physicians here in the room, but it, 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 it helps me, you know, balance that a little bit more in favor of your bill that, you know, we're not dealing with just one person bringing in somebody and then all of a sudden having half their business go away in a purely business relationship. Yeah, I, I don't want a single word change, no, <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm good. This is a, this is a, a, a really, purely a, a, a exploratory bill uh, to, to, to get this out there and let's talk about it a little bit. And anything that we can do to, to uh, uh, help patients and, and oh. uh, help uh, the medical practice. Access is key. And you know, Joplin's a major medical center in the Southwest. But it's, it's still it's still key. I've known physicians that have had those these covenants enforced, and they have to leave. And then we're down, you know, one uh, orthopedic surgeon, we're down, you know, a cardiac surgeon, we're down a cardiologist, whatever. And it's hard to recruit, especially with our other climates in the state now. So I I, I agree. I like your bill for especially in our areas where it's harder to recruit. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? I have one. Um, I think there's a little difference, not only between a 501c3 and an independent practice group, but I think there's a difference between having a restrictive covenant, which is usually two years and some distance, I don't know, what is that, 10 miles, 20 miles, where there's 50, I see. I think there's a difference between having that in effect for a, the location where the individual is practicing. But when you have a hospital system that has hospitals and clinics dotted all over the state or say the Midwest. And the non-competes, as I understand it, sometimes these non-competes will be enforced with a 50 mile radius around each one of those other entities. When you only practice in a single entity, but because it is a part of a hospital system, you may be prevented from entering any of those markets. Have you, in your research into this bill, which I understand has been quite extensive, have you uh, encountered anything like that? That you, because I think that is the case in, in medical practice now in some hospital systems. It, it wouldn't surprise me uh, that uh, I have not run into that, but it would not surprise me that that does happen because there are we are getting in an age of where we're getting consolidation, and uh, uh, I can see where that happens. In other areas, I've seen that that also happens. Maybe there's some other expert witnesses that can help us with that. We need some attorney assistance here. Any further questions from the, from the any further questions from the thing? See, none of you are prepared to have some uh, testimony. Um, I have no idea if we have anybody in our favor or against. Anyone to testify in favor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Jeff Howell with the Missouri State Medical Association. Some of you may remember the Stone Age of 2008-2009. This was, bill was introduced. Uh, it was, a, it was an annual event back in those days. We haven't seen it for a while. And it, it was a little different, those bills, uh, a few years ago, because they also applied to hospital physician employment contracts, which this bill does not, does not do. I think um, one of the things that we like about this bill is that when uh, a hospital hires an attorney, or I'm sorry, hires a physician and asks that physician to go practice out in a rural area, like say, you know, do sales or wherever it might be, they have these non-compete clauses so that when that period of time is up, that physician can no longer see those patients in that community. And that's a burden to the physician. The physician, if he chooses not to renew that contract, has to move, or if the doctor chooses not to renew the contract, the physician has to move because he can't see those patients. In addition to that, those patients lose their position that they've had for the last 10 years. So it's fairly burdensome in these rural communities, these non-compete clauses. Um, we think it's interesting enough to the public good that we'd like to see this bill extended to include those hospital kind of hospital physician contracts. 
I'm off. We have to answer any questions if I can. Does the committee have any questions for Mr. Hoffman? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Any further witnesses in favor? Any witnesses that wish to testify in opposition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, member of the committee, David Hale, representing the Missouri Hospital Association today. Uh, I'm spoken with the sponsor on the bill of understanding. Uh, the reason that the bill was filed and uh, agree with uh, Mr. Hale that uh, this was sponsored in various forms uh, in the past and back in the Stone Ages. Uh, we haven't seen it for a while, but the uh, Intent of the bill, I, I don't think, uh, if it was in, to include entities such as hospitals. So I'm going to I'm going to speak to the bill and oppose the bill as if that was the case because I don't see that list of entities. Uh, for my licensed medical professionals, those licensed to practice medicine under Chapter 334, it might be. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it might be more appropriate to direct your remarks toward the bill we have in front of us right now, which really doesn't mention hospitals. I don't believe. I'm, I'm no attorney, but it seems to me that it says it deals with agreements between physicians or other licensed medical professionals. That that is true. It's between uh, physicians <coughs> or licensed or medical professionals. But it's not between somebody and somebody else. So it wouldn't. I mean, do you view this as it's written as affecting the hospitals? As it's written, uh, I would suggest that it's probably not. Although uh, I believe that that might have been the intent. I'm not. I'm not I'm just, you're playing my discussion. In my discussion. Now, you're you're ascribing intent to the uh, legislation. Let's, well, I, I'm, I'm not, not, not going to ascribe to the intent to the intent to the intent to I'll just say that uh, in my discussions with others that uh, I, I believe that would. Let's, let's do this. this. Let's, for now, confine your testimony to how your association would feel with the plain language of the law as it's written. And if there are any committee members that wonder what the position of your association might be if it were to include hospitals, we'll let them question sure. in that regard. So Very good. does the association have any objection to this applying to agreements between physicians as it's written? Or do you know what, what the position is of the association? Between physicians, uh, licensed medical professionals, those track, uh, uh, License to practice under 334. Uh, I could not get a comment on that, although I, I'm not sure uh, what that would. Maybe you can help me out. Who, yeah, who would that apply to? Let me let me expand on that a little bit. It would seem to me, since each individual hospital across our state has, as part of its mission, to meet the health care needs of the public that it serves, that it would be furthering their mission and their goals to keep physicians in the community who wish to remain in the community, but who cannot do so solely because of a non compete clause. So it would seem it would be in harmony with the mission of our hospitals to advocate against legal arrangements that cause physicians to have to leave the service area of the hospital. Now, maybe I'm missing some other aspect of it, but it, it seems to me that it's just limited to physicians in the community, and it's not physicians employed by the hospital, as I interpret the plain language of this proposal to be, it would be in keeping with the hospital's mission to oppose these non-compete clauses. But tell me where I'm going wrong. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, you're correct. My uh, my mission and my responsibility is to speak on behalf of the hospital. So if we are not impacted uh, by the language, then uh, I would not be uh, in my fiduciary responsibility Holding that to, to oppose it. But the, I will say that uh, I'll just comment on the possibility that you had mentioned of expanding it. Let's we'll wait and see if any committee members have that in mind and sure. they can ask you about it. So, <laughs> Mr. Kirkman, did you have a question? I, I do. How about expansion? Um, may I inquire, please? Um, David, my question is, is um, this doesn't include hospitals, but would it include, say, like, 
St. Louis U, who is employed or owned by Tenant, which is, as I understand, are they a corporation? Isn't there a for profit hospital? Is, is, uh, um, is uh, St. Louis U and Tenant a corporation? Yeah, it's Tenant owns. Correct. Yes. So, and I, I don't know, are they set up as a corporation? Since they're um, for profit. Absolutely, sure. Yes. So, in that instance, it might apply to Blue Hospital? So, uh, it's, a, it's a corporate agreement. Uh, and again, I did do a double take and, and read it again, which I should know. Uh, so that's the describing the agreement, and then the, it's between physicians or other licensed medical professionals. Uh, hospital is obviously not a professional it's an entity. Uh, uh, that restricts the right of a physician licensed to practice under Chapter 334, which is supposed to be a license, uh, or other licensed medical professionals. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would suggest that it will probably not impact it. Uh, I would need to get have my counsel take another look at this, which I am a little, uh, I'll say sheepishly and say that we should have seen it earlier. I should have seen it earlier, but uh, I don't see us in there unless you can point where, where else it would be. Okay. Thank you. Answer your question? Okay. Thank you. I want to return for a moment, and I'll give you this a second, Dr. Healy, but uh, the way I read it now, physicians could not be subject to non compete agreements. And so more physicians would remain within the community. So it would just strike me that the hospital would have a vested interest in testifying in favor of this bill. Can you see that line of reasoning? That if more physicians are available to help the hospital meet their goal of meeting the health care needs of the community, it would seem in the interest of the hospital to meet their goal that they would favor this legislation. Does that seem right to you or not? More well, physicians in the community is desirable, I would, I would assume. I, your, the outcome you described is desirable, and I would say that we would support, you know, if, if this uh, does that. Uh, to the extent or, it would do that, then. Uh, yeah, I, I can't. I, I'm not here to testify in favor of it. So, uh, yeah, I just want to take it back. We're going to actually do another double take on this and take a look at it. So, the, I will say that, you know, the on the employment side, a significant uh, whether it's rural, whether it's urban, uh, if a physician is employed, there is a significant investment made uh, typically to bring that physician to that hospital uh, and to set up the uh, overhead, which is the uh, office, the assistant, you know, everything else that goes with that, uh, the equipment, etc. So, uh, you know, there is a that side of this question in terms of the employment. Now, I realize that we're suggesting this is not what we're talking about. And you realize by my silence, I've given you a little attitude to go ahead and talk about yeah, you were very what it is anyway. Thank so, you very much. Okay. Any further questions for Mr. Hay? All right. Seeing none, are there any other witnesses that wish to testify in opposition? And there's no one further to testify in favor. Are there any individuals that wish to testify for information purposes only? That will then conclude, unless that will conclude our hearing of 2061. Thank you. And now let us proceed to a consideration of House Bill 1585. And okay, you may begin when you are ready. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee for allowing me to present House Bill 1585. I represent Andrew Koenig out of West St. Louis County. Um, what this bill does is it um, outlaws um, abortions for the purpose of sex selection and genetic abnormalities. Um, and it's quite simple. If, if you are acknowledging that the baby in the womb is either male or female, you're also acknowledging that it's alive. And um, there's been eight states that have proceeded um, or have measures like this. Um, also with the genetic abnormalities, I've known many instances when um, 
you know, uh, a mother has been told that there's been issues. It turns out after they're born, there isn't. Um, so, with that, I'll take any questions. How many people are vying for the quickest presentation in <laughs> history? President Cross. Proceed. It's interesting. I've never heard of this. Unborn, I mean, due to the sex of the unborn child, how long has this been unborn? Well, okay. I mean, it, it happens. Yes, and it happens. I just figured, in general, if they, if they don't want to bear the child, I didn't realize that the sex would come into the picture. So if they got two girls, and, and, and uh, they want a boy, and they got another the girl, so let's just get rid of it, huh? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions? Yes, Representative Matt. <laughs> Thank you, Joe Moore. Proceed. Um, I guess I'm going to get a little late here, but um, when you say there's a large, and I'm going to, I don't think there's a large difference between choosing based on the sex of the baby than for a medical reason. I guess, and not that I, I, I don't know why I'm, I agree with the pro-life position, all that, but I said lumping those two together is, um, Extreme, I guess, might be. I mean, you just said it because they all have to make extreme. But I guess, I mean, I completely agree with the whole sex, the choosing for sex. Exactly. I mean, I can yeah. sign off that second. But on the medical side, oh boy, I mean, just, I guess, what's your response to that? I mean, I don't think it's extreme at all. I mean, if you look across text, medi or textbooks in universities, I mean, science tells us that, you know, life begins at conception. And if you are peering into the womb and determining different factors, you're also acknowledging that the baby is alive. So I don't think that would, that's, 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 that's that makes it not a valid reason. I, 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 I get it. Okay, I, I, I get it from, from, the, from the, the black and white position. I get that. I get that. I really do. I'm just saying that, you know, you sit here and read some of the stories of, of the people who have, you know, tough issues, you know, being still born, whatever. And, 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 and I, I mean, I, and, and I, I'm, I, I, I've never been in this position. Probably, would, if I were in that position, we would probably try to carry the baby to term, whether it was, you know, because I, I mean, I, I had a, I had a, ne a nephew that died with uh, six months after he born. And so I mean, I, I've been there. I was there when the kid died. Yeah, we, okay. We, we, okay. I know we personally we've lost our last three pregnancies. Okay, and so yeah, I mean, I get around twenty. Years. And I mean, I'm at, well, I had the deal. with my sister, you know, my nephew. You know, but I guess lumping. The, the medical in with the sex selection thing it is is a, a, a leap in one thing. Not that I disagree with it. I think it's a leap. And I guess it's maybe more of a comment kind of a thing. And just as we go forward with the discussion, something to consider. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Pace, you have a question. Oh, it was just Oh, it was answered. All right. Thank you. Uh, Representative Wayne. Time to inquire, please. Proceed. I'm going away from the subject matter of your bill, but as an attorney, I, I'm looking at this. Right now, in the first trimester, a female can have an abortion. Without, she can have it. It's our law. Going in and you qualifying these things, you know within this you can't. The person just has to not say it. And it doesn't have. I, 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 I'm looking at this from a legal quandary, saying, "Boy, this could be messy. This is going to be lawsuits. Uh, this is a." You know, I, I didn't really say that. And I, it's my right. You know, I, I'm playing the other side here. Okay, I, I decided I want this procedure. I'm a female, and you misunderstood what I said. If somebody says, "No, no, you just said it," I appreciate what you want to do. But I have concerns about what this is going to do to our legal in, in our legal system with this. So have you? I mean, how are you? Tell me what what you're seeing with this. Well, I mean, I, what, why, why is what I said? You know, if, if the lady says, "Oh no, wait, I didn't say that. You misunderstood me." I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, um, but uh, I don't think it causes any problems. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions? Okay, do you have any witnesses and uh, testimony?
Okay. I'm sure that'll be fine. Mr. Chairman, committee, for the record, Karen Messer on behalf of Americans United for Life. Uh, I want to start by uh, addressing these questions because Representative White's question answers Representative Ness' question. Uh, the bill expressly says that these prohibitions will not prohibit abortions for other reasons. We know this bill most likely is not going to stop very many abortions. The issue and the reason why they're tied together is because these are the types of abortions where there needs to be a second breath where you're stopped to say, why, can't, why shouldn't I have the abortion for this reason? And there's good reasons not to have abortions for these reasons. And it's to help the, uh, the mother to be, to understand that there are many other options. First, on the sex selection, that we've got tons of people on the waiting list waiting for these babies. And they'll take them, most of the time, any gender. Many times, they'll specify a gender. And if someone doesn't want a baby because it's a specific gender, there's hundreds of people just waiting to receive that baby. And maybe that's all that mother needs to hear, to know, okay, this is the wrong decision for me. On the genetic and abnormality side, here's the problem. 90% plus of all babies that with one test, the mother's been told has Down syndrome, or likely to have Down syndrome, will abort that baby for that reason and that reason alone. But I would challenge the members of this committee that if you think the vast majority of us in this room knows women who've been told they had a genetic abnormality in their unborn child, chose to carry that child to term, and there was absolutely nothing wrong with that child, it begs the question, how many children are being aborted in this state and in this country that have absolutely nothing wrong with them, and the only reason they're being aborted is because they've been told there may be a genetic abnormality. The question on the table gives this mother the opportunity to look at these statistics and look at these realities and maybe go have a second test done, maybe get another opinion from another lab, and maybe they'll find out, you know, they almost made the biggest mistake they could ever make. That's the reason why these two issues are in the same bill. And that's the reason why we believe it's good public policy to say, we need to stop a moment and just take a second breath and say, you know, if this is your only reason for aborting this baby, let's talk further. That's the purpose of the legislation. And I hope that makes some sense. But I'll, I'll stop there so other people come forward and just take questions if you have them. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. Trump? Yes, Representative White. Uh, to inquire briefly. Proceed. Thank you. Uh, I think you know my position on sure. pro life. But no again, I'm looking at this. If a, a female were to say, okay, I'm here, I, I, you know, if you're a student of history, you understand in different cultures favor male children or usually males over females. It happens around the world. But you get a scenario where somebody says, okay, I want a boy or whatever it is. And no, nope, it's not that, so I want to have an abortion. They've told you that right now, they can't do it. Correct. And they say, and you say, oh, I can't do it because you said this. Right? Right. Oh, but I also want it because I don't have any money. Correct. They've now given you a second reason. Mm -hmm. Under this bill, they have another reason. I have, they now have a reflection period. We right. have a 24 hour law uh, right. in law right now. Well, uh, and we, we, may, we may have a 72 hour right. uh, reflection period in the near future. I don't know uh, how that's going to go. But that young, that mother is now going to go home because of that reflection period. Now during that reflection period, they're going to be thinking about, why did I have to come give another reason? And again, it gives opportunity. This is the committee that heard very compelling testimony on giving notice to the second parent. Because someone else getting involved in the discussion with this young lady uh, or mother-to-be can completely change the outcome of the plans. Okay. Okay. And so this is to initiate those discussions. Okay. I, I wanted to, I guess, I appreciate your, your yeah. that, that, However, that. My concern would be that you don't think that it's going to stop them from having it. However, when they however, give you that second reason. Correct. However, I do want to draw the committee's attention to the fact that Planned Parenthood sitting at this very table in past years 
has expressly said they will do abortions for sex selection purposes only in Missouri. That is their policy, and that's one reason why I believe you know it's valid to address this because we know that option is there uh, without providing appropriate counsel to this lady. I don't disagree with what we're doing here. I'm, just, I'm looking at the, the practicality of what this sure, is going to do in sure. the legal if, system. If, if the I, industry I, is not going to police itself on this front, then it begs legislation to police them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you very much. The reform. Any further testimony in favor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, uh, Samuel Lee with Campaign Life Missouri, you go on record in support of House Bill 1585, and I'll keep my comments brief. Um, there are uh, eight, as the, the sponsor said, there are eight states that now ban abortions for uh, gender uh, selection or sex selection purposes. Uh, South Dakota became the most recent state a week ago today when their governor uh, signed that into law. And one state, North Dakota, passed a bill last year that not only uh, bans them for sex uh, selection reasons, but also for a child with Down syndrome for a genetic abnormality. They did all that in one bill, similar to this, but a little bit different words. Uh, and that was initially challenged, and then that challenge was dropped. So that is in effect. Uh, so that's uh, North Dakota is the only state that would have for banning for Down syndrome. Uh, I would say, uh, Representative White and others, um, I think one of the issues that, that comes up with sex selection abortion is the pressure that's on the mother of that unborn child. And we see that certainly in India with, with dowry murders. Uh, you have this whole uh, range of uh, assaults on women and girls, uh, sex selection abortion, infanticide of, of females. I would encourage you, if you have Netflix, live uh, streaming of Netflix, to take a look at the It's a Girl movie, which has documents this in India and China. But also, it appears that in some of the cultures in, uh, who are in this country, certainly in Great Britain we know about this, but also in this country, uh, cultures that are of, of people who are, are some, from some of these countries, India, China, etc. Uh, there is a pressure on these women as well. Oh, you have a girl, uh, that's, we need to have a son, you need to get an abortion. So this is, gives that woman an opportunity to uh, make it to say no or to indicate to the physician or the nurses. Is it an absolute barrier to this being done? Of course not. But it, it, it's a, another opportunity for her to make that choice freely and without coercion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Lee? Hey, I do have one. When we, you bring the perspective of what's going on in other states, in the other states, and apparently there's just one that's done it for genetic. Genetic endowments in your life, yes. In that state, does it prevent abortion in any uh, child that has been identified as Downs, or does it, like this statute would do, yeah, prevent right. that as being a reason? Uh, I, think, I think it's solely for that reason. I think it, it, it mirrors what's in this one okay. here. So solely for that, if it's solely for that reason, if there's multiple reasons, no, that's not okay. Because if you identify that a Down syndrome child cannot be aborted, you then create a situation where a normal child could be. Yes. But a Down syndrome right, child couldn't be. But so you think the language is similar to what we I think it's what they have in North Dakota is solely for that reason. Yes. And North Dakota is the only one that's done the combined right. genetic and by sex selection. The others have done sex selection. Oh, right. Well, it's interesting. Three of our, our adjoining states have passed a ban on sex selection abortion. Illinois was the first state, uh, uh, Oklahoma and Kansas. So some of the states surrounding us have already dealt with this, at least on the sex selection end of things. Any further questions? Thank you very much. Further testimony in favor? Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, Susan Klein representing Missouri Right to Life. Here to go on record, she in support of House Bill 1585. And I won't repeat the information that's been heard, but it, you know, the bills that have passed in other states, I think some of the concerns uh, would have been challenged and we would be seeing those. And we're watching, obviously, what's going on with this bill in other states as well. So um, we know that there uh, have been abortions done, or, or the women have been told that there were physical abnormalities, and they went ahead and chose to carry their babies to term, and their baby was fine, their baby was perfect. When you look at a woman who's walking into an abortion facility, and that abortion facility is there to make a profit on that abortion, 
then you have to question uh, what's being done. So I, I think you have to look at sometimes um, <coughs> challenging what, what is being told to these women as they walk into these clinics. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Do you have any yes. questions? Yes. We'll see. How do you know that's careful? Based on uh, what women have, what we've been told, the women have been told whenever they walk into the clinics. Uh, well, I don't have, I, I can't tell you any names, um, but yes, I mean, I, I can't tell you the names, but people have told us that they've walked in and they've been told that their baby had had uh, physical abnormalities and they chose to carry their baby to term. Any further questions? Yes, Representative. Yes, thank you, Jim Clark. Ms. Kersey. Do you know the percentages of those? I do not have those with me. Okay, could you get that for us, please? Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. None. Thank you very much. And please leave the witness one. Is there any further testimony in support? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Tyler McClure, General Counsel of Missouri Catholic Conference. I want to go on the record of support of this bill. Um, I'm going to attach to my witness form a, um, an article that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. They went back and looked at census data from 2000, and this was published in 19, or 2008, and they found that there was um, male biased sex ratios in the children of Chinese, U.S. born children of Chinese, Korean, and Asian Indian parents. And the only way they could explain that is it particularly had to do with second and third children if they hadn't had a prior son. There was sex selection going on in the, in the later children. And um, they interpreted the data um, to be uh, evidence of sex selection, most likely at the prenatal stage. So there, this is something, obviously, that's very common in India, as Sam Lee mentioned. Um, but it is also happening in the U.S. in those populations, and it's a cultural thing for them in many cases. Um, so I just want to point that out and open my witness. You know, I had occasion to tour China. I was on a medical study tour of China when I was still a medical student, so it's been a few years ago. But at that time, they still had their one-child policy in effect, and it was widely known in the villages and places that we went where you know, there was sex selection going on. If they're only going to have one child, they were going to select the sex they wanted. And I think China has a disproportionate number of males. Mm -hmm. um, Are there any questions for witness? No. Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, is there any further testimony in support? <coughs> Welcome and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Elise Costo. I'm a registered lobbyist on behalf of Concerned Women for America in Missouri. We just like to go on the record in support of this legislation. Very succinct testimony. Thank you. Legal witness form. Are there any questions for witness? No. Thank you very much. Any further testimony in support? And is there any testimony in opposition? Welcome. We meet again. Um, good afternoon. I'm Crystal Williams with the American Civil Liberties Union, Missouri. And the line from the, from the ACLU, Missouri, is that this is another one of the situations where we feel like the state is interfering in um, families' very personal decision making. But I'm also going to do something today that I've not done in 20 years of testifying in front of committees in this building. My family. Um, has a genetic, there's a genetic disease that runs in my family that is carried by the women in the family that only affects males, similar to hemophilia, in terms of the way it's passed down. My mother lost three brothers to this disease. They died when they were very, very young. They, it was very painful. It was horrible. It's an autoimmune deficiency disease. And when they were born, they, they didn't have tests for it. They had nothing that they could do in order to see. So she lost three of her nine siblings, before two of them before they reached three years old. And when my husband and I decided to have a child, I had to go through, I went through extensive testing to see if I was a carrier. We had to go through testing. I, I was going to have a boy. I have a healthy, happily, a healthy 14-year-old son. 
But I have to tell you that, and you know I've been before you many times this session, and we're talking many times this session about things that have to do with me, my decision making, my body. This one today, and, I, and I'm not saying that, that the representative or anyone else is coming, to, coming to, at this with ill will, but I think that this is, yeah, I think this is another example of just way too far that we've gone. I think that a couple of representatives today have pointed out that it's almost unworkable the way that you would have to be as intrusive as you would have to be in order to make this work. So I appreciate your indulgence while you allow me to talk about something that is intensely personal for my family, but it also gives you an example of why the sex of a child could be an issue, and with a number of genetically passed diseases, that is in fact the case. Thank you. Are there any questions for us? Okay, none. Thank you. Thank you. Any further testimony in opposition? Good afternoon, my name is Ryan Summerford and I'm the statewide manager of government affairs for Planned Parenthood Advocates in Missouri. I'm here today to um, register Planned Parenthood Advocates in Missouri's um, opposition to this bill, uh, House Bill 1585. Oppositions to abortion continue to look for new ways to try to stop abortions from happening and to try different angles into intervening between um, a patient, a family decision, and medical practices. And um, it's just wrong. Women should not be forced by politicians to carry the term a fetus that has genetic abnormality and may be incompatible with life. I want to be clear that abortion is a deeply personal and complex decision that a woman makes. She does not make it on a whim. She does not use it for birth control. She doesn't use it in a matter that can only be described sometimes as a flippant decision making that a woman makes. A woman makes a decision to have an abortion based on deep conversations and deep family values between her family, her doctor, and her faith. In the state of Missouri, and politicians should not be included in that. 1585 mistrusts women, and it further turns doctors into the judgment police. 1585 <coughs> attempts to restrict or deny access to safe abortion under the guise of preventing a gender bias, which is primarily a political attack used by groups whose main purpose is to make abortion illegal. This is harmful to women's health and harmful to the human rights agenda. Planned Parenthood opposes any legislation that intrudes in the doctor-patient relationship, requiring doctors to become investigators and patients to become suspects, which strips the non-judgmental, high-quality care from women that they need. Furthermore, I'd like to point out that Planned Parenthood works to ensure that women and their families have high-quality, non-judgmental care, period. Planned Parenthood does not offer uh, health services for um, sex determination, and our ultrasounds are conducted and limited to medical purposes only. I'd also like to point out that Planned Parenthood, including the Reproductive Health Services, which is unincorporated <coughs> from Planned Parenthood, is a nonprofit, 501c3. In addition to my testimony, I brought forth with you a six-page document of stories from women telling their personal stories of instances where they have had to come to a personal private medical decision. 
for each of you on this committee, I ask that you read that. I ask that you take these stories into consideration, and I ask that you oppose 1585. Does that conclude your testimony? That concludes my testimony. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the witness? I have one. Sure. Um, let's say for the moment that this bill confined its uh, requirements to just preventing sex selection, using abortion for sex selection. What would your organization's opinion be of that? Planned Parenthood offers non judgmental care for women in need. Let me pose it another way then. If a woman came to you and said, I, I'm having a boy and I'd rather have a girl, I want to have an abortion for this baby because it's a boy, would you then say that because Planned Parenthood is non judgmental, they would, they would proceed with? Please, to that question. If the woman came to Planned Parenthood and said, as I previously outlined, I'm wanting a girl. I'm having a boy, and I would like to have an abortion to get rid of this pregnancy. Would Planned Parenthood proceed with that, or would there be something in, in your process that would say, wait, that is for sex selection purposes, and we don't believe in that? Just, it's very, I don't want you to explain it's not it. It's black and white, and I can't give you a, a black and white yeah, answer. Tell me whether you would or would not proceed. I mean, I'm going to accept that answer as we would do it. I'm going to say that it's a very complicated and complex question. A woman doesn't come into a situation where she's um, inquiring about and getting information about abortion or putting that in for just sex selection purposes and to turn doctors into police and try to yeah, investigate. We're not talking about turning doctors into police. Let me just I, say, I think it is. a hypothetical. The woman comes in and says specifically and only, I do not want a boy, I want a girl. Would you proceed. Would your organization proceed with that abortion? Simple question. It's not a simple question, and there's not a simple All right. answer. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the committee? Representative Walsh, proceed. Um, kind of uh, not to the witness, but I would like to ask the sponsor one if I may. Okay, yes. we're done with the witness. You may direct it that way. And if there's no more questions for the witness, does anyone have any questions for the witness? Okay. Thank you very much. And you can leave a uh, good word. Yes, Representative White, to inquire for the sponsor. Uh, to the sponsor of the bill. Uh, you know, I would, the legal things that you, you can tell, I, I, my whole mind is working as an attorney and I can see issues. On some of the testimony we've heard from the supporting witnesses, uh, have you considered an approach of a second opinion requirement on these issues as opposed to? You know, the, the ban issue to me, legally, I, I think it's going to be really hard to work because people you're saying not to do it are going to be the people that have to police it. And it's kind of like telling lawyers not to do lawyer you know, things. Uh, would, you know, just one of the things that pops in my mind to actually accomplish a time thing, you know, the, the, uh, a reflection period of, and this is just off the top of my head, I, this is not free thought, but a requirement of us as opposed you know, to say, the, an outside second opinion, if you will. I mean, maybe that I'm sure they'll say it's too hard to get to them, transportation, whatever else. But to 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 get that second opinion, one, it, it, I don't know that those places would do the test. But if they're saying you may have a dramatic abnormality, I would personally want to have or somebody of my choosing being doing some tests. But that that's just something I wanted to throw out to you as would it, it's a potential future consideration, as opposed to this route of doing maybe a different route to accomplish what you want. We can, we can always look at that. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yes, President. Yes, you may. Good afternoon, Representative. Um, I came in sort of when we were heading into the supporting testimony, and I believe I heard some talk about um, the abortions related to Down and genetic abnormalities giving the woman a chance for reflection. And I'm just I'm just looking at this bill and if a woman um, reflects and then decides to proceed, I, I think she would either have to lie or not be able to have the abortion. I just wanted to clarify Yeah, I mean, that. it would require for her to come up with a different reason. Yeah, okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes, Representative Cross. Just a brief comment and an inquiry. I met you about four years ago, I think. 2010 and 2017. I didn't know you. Okay? And you remember your wife came to town also? Mm -hmm. Okay. You have how many children now? Three. Three children. Okay. And I guess where I'm going with it on this bill is this. Well, as I think I know your wife, I've talked to her a couple times. I've seen her here, so. If you wrote a bill that Miss Crust went, your wife found out about it, let me tell you something. You going home, she'll be waiting for you at the front door. I promise you that. Thank you, Johnny. Didn't know exactly where you're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife and I still support this show. Okay. Any further questions for the point? And have we concluded any test? Nobody here wants to testify in favor or opposed or for information purposes. No. That will conclude our hearing on health oh, care. And that will conclude our hearing for today. Thank you. Most of them. Okay. Were you in the Missouri Catholic